expressing my sincere gratitude to the Tri-State Federation for inviting me to participate in today's event. And today we're going to talk about three of the most fundamental questions regarding life itself. Throughout my presentation, we're going to talk about one of those questions, and that is, where do we come from? A few days after I was invited to come and speak about this topic, I heard a conversation on the radio concerning pregnancy, where babies come from, and the like, and talking about all of this to children. And someone commented that interestingly, when it comes to pregnancy, children will often want to know how that baby gets out of there before how it got in there in the first place. And so I thought to myself, you know, that's kind of interesting because I think that even as adults, we approach the bigger questions of life in the same way. We wonder what happens when this life is over? How do we get out, or where do we go? And usually we'll ask these questions before we ever wonder where we came from. Sometimes I think that's just because we accept that we were created, or somehow came into being, and that we just really have no other way to understand what that means. And well, we can only interpret things according to what we're familiar with, right? <laughs> and at the same time, there's always, at any given time, limits to what we are capable of understanding. But usually, there's quite a gap between what we are already familiar with and what we are capable of comprehending. So when someone or something is able to explain things to us with information that is new to us and that we are able to process, then we expand our awareness. And when that kind of growth is significant enough, it can change the way that we see things. And that's the kind of life-changing impact that Spiritism can have on us. But Spiritism also teaches us to see things in a holistic manner. So that in coming to understand any one of those three questions that we're talking about today, we will inevitably come to know more about the answers to all three of them. And that's why we're going to see today why they are so interrelated. At the same time, in this specific moment, we are going to focus on where we come from. We're going to concentrate primarily on, on this book by Alan Kardec, Genesis, specifically the chapter called Spiritual Genesis. And because we are going to address several topics that fall within spiritist principles, I'm going to keep them displayed up here throughout the discussion. And as we go along, we'll talk about what each of them means conceptually and what they mean to us in terms of their relevancy to our daily lives. Now, curiously, to back up and ask the question about where we come from, well, then we first have to define who we are. As mentioned in The Spirit's Book, also by Alan Kardec, we all have an instinctive sense of the future life, and this comes from an awareness that our spirits had even before beginning this material lifetime. But without having that information from The Spirit's Book or other resources like those we find in Spiritism, even having just this intuitive sense alone, still, reason would lead us to believe that if we exist in some way, once this physical life is over, then there is something in us that survives the physical 
physical body. And then what is that something? At the same time, we know that we think, we reason, we have feelings, we have will and we make choices, and we are also aware of our own presence in relation to those around us. So again, reason leads us to believe that the cause or the source of all of this has to be something other than just inert matter. Now, to this kind of logic, as well as to the grand collection of philosophical and religious teachings, those that at their most basic level at least are in agreement with this kind of thought of our survival of the body, we add our knowledge from spiritism, which offers us scientific and practical evidence for the same ideas, but derived from spirit phenomena and spirit communications. And so we're going to talk now about what spiritism has to tell us. So now when we ask who we are, well, we are incarnate human spirits. We are presently living in the material realm on a material world that we call the earth. And we do have an immortal soul. Now this soul is the source of our intelligence, of all of our thoughts. And it represents our individuality. The individuality that we preserve forever from the moment we are created. And this soul is always accompanied by a semi-material body or a body that's just of a matter that's less dense than the matter that we typically think of. And we call this body the perispirit. The perispirit has many functions that we study in spiritism, but it represents the physical form that is perceived by others when they are able to see spirits. And of course we have the material body that we're all very familiar with, the very spirit acts as an intermediary between the soul and the material body. So in part, it allows the soul to act or direct its will on the physical body. And at the same time, when external impressions are made on the physical body, it will allow the soul or the spirit to register them. And by the way, this, this very spirit is the same energetic body where we find vital centers or energy centers, commonly known by many as chakras. So having established this as our baseline, we can now go back to our question and ask, where do these high level components of our being come from? So spiritism teaches us that there are two basic elements in the universe from which everything is derived by action of natural laws that operate according to God's will. One of these elements is spirit, which represents the intelligent element in creation. Our human souls actually result from an individualization of the spiritual principle and so in a way, this element is where our souls come from. And the non-intelligent element of the universe is matter. Matter has numerous properties, including those that we know of and that we study in, in the general knowledge of science, and those yet to be discovered. Though we find matter in a perhaps infinite variety of forms, all forms are derived from a single primitive element that permeates throughout the entirety of universal space, both the material and the spiritual realms, and we call this the universal cosmic fluid. Our peri-spirits and our physical bodies are 
are formed from a matter that is derived from that basic material element. Now, there are in nature forms of life that don't think as we do, right? Plants, for instance. So you may wonder where the vitality comes from in those life forms. Well, this vitality, similar to an energy circuit that runs through a battery, comes from something that spiritism calls the vital principle, which itself is just a modified form of that basic material element called the universal cosmic fluid. And this is something that we find actually discussed in the spirits book, but Kardec does bring it up in this chapter in, in Genesis to make the point that the vital principle and the spiritual principle are two different things. The vital principle is inherent in organic life, where the spiritual principle is inherent to intelligent life. And so Kardec provides an example. He says that the independence of the two is what allows, for example, for the physical body to continue functioning during our times of sleep, while the spirit is able to engage in activities elsewhere in the spiritual realm. The most important thing from what I have just mentioned so far is that the there is a broader independence between spirit and matter. And that is very important to us. The fact that we have an immortal existence, independent from matter, including our physical bodies, has significant implications that are actually at the foundation of understanding our existence. In addressing the questions of what happens to us when life on earth ends, this spiritual existence means that although our physical bodies will perish, we as individuals who think and who feel, we go on living. And therefore, the knowledge and the virtues that we acquire are never lost. The efforts that we make to overcome all of our struggles are not wasted. And the bonds of love and affection that we form with others, they're not destroyed with the, the destruction, for example, of the physical body. As I mentioned before, although we may sense this continuity of life intuitively, and though we may also find teachings about the soul's survival among our diverse philosophies and religions, still with them, it's possible for us to fall into doubt. So spiritism reinforces our beliefs in these ideas, but offers a way to make them palpable through experimental evidence. And on top of that, the more detailed set of moral and philosophical principles that we find in spiritism, all derived from a combination of observance, reasoning, and revelation, they offer us a concrete way to understand and find meaning in the otherwise confusing or maybe inexplicable aspects of life. And it is in this that we find the motivation to continue seeking our own improvement and to endure all the challenges that we face in this crazy life. Our spiritual existence, independent of matter, does not, though, just address the questions about life after death or even why we're here, two topics that are going to be addressed today by other speakers. It is also very relevant on where we come from. So in that regard, like the child's often secondary question about how that baby gets out, or even how it got here, we can ask ourselves how we got here. 
And let's begin by talking about the process by which a spirit begins the material life and acquires the physical body. And then we'll zoom out to talk about how we ended up coming to this specific material world that we call Earth. But let me first ask a question. In the process that we call death, does the physical body perish because the spirit leaves it? No. In fact, the spirit leaves the body because upon the eventual failure of the, of the bodily organs, organic life can no longer be sustained. So that vital principle that I had mentioned withdraws, and then the ties between the spirit and matter are undone. And at this point, the spirit can be free. So the opposite happens at the start of a new incarnation. As the body is formed, the spirit becomes united to matter. So I'd like to share with you a direct quote from Alan Kardec, where he talks about how this process takes place. And he writes, when the spirit must incarnate in a human body that is about to be formed, a fluidic tie, which is nothing but an extension of its fairy spirit, connects it to the zygote, to which it is attracted by an irresistible force from the moment of conception. As the fetus develops, the tie tightens. Under the influence of the fetus's vital material principle, the fairy spirit, which possesses certain properties of matter, is united molecule by molecule to the body that is forming. A fact from which one may deduce that the spirit, through the intermediary of its fairy spirit, in a way takes root in the fetus, much as a plant takes root in the soil. When the fetus is fully developed, the union is complete and the being is born to external life. So this explanation gives us an idea on how that physical process takes, takes place. And it is quite fascinating to read even further details in spiritist literature about how the incarnating spirit, the spirits of the parents, and even mentoring spirits in the spirit realm all are involved and participate in all of this activity. But for the purposes of this discussion here today, what I would like to highlight is the fact that when a new child comes into this world, it is truly only the body that is new. That spirit is a being that has already been in existence. And in following its own evolutionary trajectory, it has its own history of incarnations prior to this one. Now because of that, the spirit of that child already has an acquired set of virtues and talents, developed at least to some degree, as well as certain weaknesses and inferior inclinations that it must work to overcome. The spirit has a memory even if unconscious of its past, which is going to affect how it sees things and how it approaches life. There is a purpose for that spirit's incarnation and is one that is part of a larger plan that was developed prior to the start of the incarnation. And that plan somehow involves the child's parents and others that will become a part of its life. Chances are the members of that, the spirit's family are no strangers, spiritually speaking. Often they are souls who have lived together in prior lifetimes. The spiritist, Emilio Miranda, he made some interesting points in one of the opening chapters to his book entitled, Our Children, Our Spirits, 
about some things that we must, he says, unlearn if we are to incorporate this spiritual understanding in the way that we see and take care of children. So he points out, for example, that contrary to our popular expressions, children really don't inherit personality traits such as intelligence, artistic inclinations, good or bad taste, charm, sweetness, aggressiveness. He says instead, each human being is unique in its psychological makeup. And only the physical characteristics are genetically transmitted from the biological parents. They produce the physical body, but not the soul. Similarly, parents and caregivers, he says, must understand that a baby has, or the spirit of the baby, an adult intelligence and a mature spirit trapped in a small, immature physical body that does not allow it to fully express itself, but this will come with time and will be observed as the child grows and becomes an adult. In later chapters of this same book, Irmina shares some stories and details that reveal an amazing awareness that the spirit of a baby has in terms of the sur its surroundings, what is going on around it, more than we would ever imagine. Something else he says that we as adults must be aware of is that the child's spirit not only has to get used to this new body, it also must go through a process of relearning in which it must get used to the language and customs of its new people. It has to master new manual skills, and it has to adapt to the overall environment and relationships that are going to be part of its new life. Erminio advises parents, and he says, you will have the privilege and responsibility of helping your child to express itself as a human being, probably in a different field of activity. He says, in fact, you will always have a great responsibility toward your children, whether they are girls or boys, intellectually gifted or challenged with a learning disability, easygoing or aggressive, healthy or sickly, calm or rebellious for some reason which you will one day understand, a child has been handed to you, attracted by you, or invited by you to come to this world. And he says, it will almost never be a total stranger whose paths have never crossed yours in the past. Don't forget that you yourself are a reborn spirit. So the material body is created through a process initiated by the child's parents. And the incarnating spirit transitions from life in the spiritual realm, where spirits actually spend the majority of their time once they're created, to life in the material realm. And we are all, as Irminio stated, reborn spirits. This new incarnation in reality is one of many that have taken place and that will take place through the process of reincarnation. So another way to address the question on where we come from is to say that we as incarnate spirits in the material world, we come from the spiritual realm or the spiritual world. Incarnation is the mechanism by which we temporarily give up life as free spirits and we return to inhabit a material body. Reincarnation is the process by which we do this many, many times over many centuries as we travel the course of what we call intellectual and moral evolution. Carmack talks about immigrations and emigrations made daily by spirits who transition 
between these two realms. And I've shown this here like that for illustration purposes, but in reality, the spiritual and material realms, they don't exist in two separate places. They coexist alongside one another. So this is sort of a more accurate depiction because we're working on a two-dimensional surface. I'm not going to go into great detail about life in the material world because that's going to be covered by another speaker. But the material world and our life here does offer us unique opportunities that facilitate our spiritual progress. So for example, the constraints of the material body require us to provide for our safety and well-being. And what's the benefit of that? Well, it motivates us to work and to develop and exercise some very important faculties. Due to the varying circumstances of our lives here, from the conditions into which we are born, the activities that we become involved in, the relationships that we are a part of, not to mention all the capabilities as well as the limitations of our own physical bodies, we will encounter in the material world all kinds of experiences and situations through which we will learn and grow. And we do this by exercising our free will and experiencing the outcome of the choices that we make. So Kardec stresses the clarification that an incarnation is not a form of punishment. It is rather just a condition inherent to our unevolved spirits as a means of progress. And the good news is that, in Kardec's words, as a spirit progresses morally, it dematerializes. That is, by freeing itself from the influence of matter, it purifies itself. Its life becomes more spiritualized, and its abilities and perceptions broaden. So subsequently, happiness then is a result of the progress that a spirit has achieved for itself. Now this process may be delayed or prolonged. It may be shortened or more direct, all depending on how we make use of our free will. Even though a mere sense or conviction that there is life after death may inspire us in the way we make choices during this life, when we have the knowledge to take a step back and look at an even bigger picture, to see that coming to life here on earth we came from life in the spirit realm. That we may have waited a really long time to come here. And that we have goals and objectives for this lifetime. Ones that were planned well before the day we were born. I think that such an understanding can really deepen our appreciation for what is the gift that is this lifetime we are now living. And to broaden that picture even more, Spiritism teaches us that our planet Earth, the material world itself, and the spiritual realm that encompasses it, it's not the only place that we find life. Life also exists in many other worlds throughout creation. And these worlds, just like our spirits, they're in all, their own state of constant evolution. The creation of worlds is constant as well. And so these worlds, again like spirits, can be found at all different levels of progress. The physical and moral progress of a particular world, planet, will always accompany the overall moral progress of its inhabitants. So this is one way that our, in our individual progress, we always contribute to the progress of a world in which we are living at any given time. And so it's also the case that spirits do move from one world to another. The, the
those daily emigrations or immigrations that spirit that, that Kardec referred to before, they don't just happen between the material and spiritual realm, they also take place between the worlds. One of the reasons why we are incarnating here right now is that this world or earth is compatible with our present evolutionary stage. Now, this doesn't mean that what we only live one time on each world, and that when a new opportunity for a new incarnation comes up, we just jump to the next one. As Kardec says, if we look around here on Earth, we find a broad spectrum of traits that will reflect the char or characterize spirits at all different levels of progress, even in just this same world. And so this illustrates how one planet like ours offers a vast field for progress. If you, if you think about it, just the contact alone between the more and less advanced spirits will facilitate a great variety of learning opportunities. And we can find inspiration and examples in those who are more developed than we are. At the same time, though, we are able to live alongside of and hopefully help or serve in some way those that we may have offended or hurt in the past. Now, by returning multiple times to the same world, we avoid the constant disruption that would be to change all the time between vastly different environments we are able, as well, to continue what we may not have finished in the last life, and we have a better chance to develop and to maintain the spiritual unions that we start forming with other spirits, all the, our bonds of affection that we form along the way. And so there are good reasons why we incarnate many times on one same world. But, when a spirit has accomplished all the degrees of progress possible in one world, according to the state of evolution that, th that that world is in at the time, the spirit will then leave to incarnate on a more advanced world. And in that more advanced world, one will find solidarity and companionship among fellow souls who share in the same will to grow, to improve, and to live in harmony. In addition, the knowledge of God and natural laws will not only be greater, it'll also be more widespread. And these characteristics will be reflected in the ratio at which we would find the presence of good to evil. The physical environment of this more advanced world is going to be more evolved as well. And so it will be more refined and more enjoyable. In the end, the more advanced a world is, the better life there will be. For happiness and love will be increasingly present, and eventually it will be increasingly predominant. This point, by the way, meaning our ability to migrate to new worlds that are on par with our own developing intellect and morality. It demonstrates just how much our degree of progress is in our own hands. Because we cannot even be held back by the less advanced progress of a world in which we've been living. Through spiritism, we always learn that if we are willing to spread our wings and make the efforts necessary to learn how to fly, then God's laws will allow us to soar as fast and as high as our own efforts and choices will take us. We need to be aware, however, that the laws of action and reaction and other laws, they work in both ways whereby these transitions don't always take us to more advanced so sometimes we move in another direction, but this doesn't happen at random. If, in our own rate of progress, we do not keep up 
with the progress of the world that we've been incarnating on. In other words, if we insist in exhibiting certain behaviors and in persisting in a certain way of thinking that is not morally in tune with our spiritual community's general degree of ethical development, then the time will come when we will no longer be permitted to incarnate in that world or in any other world that is at the same evolutionary level, at least until we have achieved the merit to do so. And so instead, we will incarnate on less advanced worlds. And this kind of transition becomes a form of self-imposed suffering for a spirit in such circumstances. Life on less advanced worlds will be much less pleasant, much less comfortable, and much more physically demanding. The material environment will be denser, and both the moral sense as well as the intellectual aptitudes and overall knowledge of the existing population will be much less developed. And adding to the exiled spirit's anguish will be the unconscious or intuitive memories of life on the world from which it was expelled. The homeland that now represents for that spirit a paradise lost, temporarily. Well, in Spiritism, we learn that suffering always has a purpose, and in some way, it always represents an opportunity. Opportunity for potential benefits such as learning, growth, purification, and redemption. And so we should expect that the case of the exiled spirit would follow the same mechanism designed with God's mercy, and in fact, it does. This experience of going to live on a less advanced world gives the spirit a chance not only to learn how to value what it did not once appreciate, but also to labor and benefit of others and thus work towards earning the merit needed to return to the kind of home that it once knew. Kardec tells us that spirits in their persistent rebellion are excluded and sent to less advanced worlds where they will need to use their intelligence and their intuition of previously acquired knowledge to help propel progress among those with whom they've been called to live. There's something else to be aware of here, which is that in either case, these transitions take place at both the individual level involving single spirits, and at a collective level, sometimes in certain cases, involving groups of spirits in a shared experience that is planned for the purpose of facilitating the progress of everyone that somehow becomes affected. But going back to the transition between worlds, in all possible circumstances, our spiritual migrations illustrate ways in which God's design incorporates a perfect order where everything has a purpose and all elements of life come together to afford us endless opportunities. These are opportunities to achieve our ultimate goal of becoming pure spirits, a condition in which we will experience true and lasting happiness. Now, we've talked today about ways to answer the question of where we come from, depending on the context of the question. But no matter how we look at it, the answer inevitably stems from our knowledge as human spirits, created by God, living and evolving according to God's natural laws. And this process of evolution involving reincarnation means that we do come from somewhere, and we have lived before, in fact, many times. As human beings, we often raise questions about why there are so many differences among us. We ask how it is determined who gets to live this life, 
or that one to be born in this place or that place? Who gets this kind of physical body or mind or that one? Could it all be just up to chance? We wonder how we ended up in one family as opposed to another one. We question why things, why uh, bad things or unfortunate, difficult things has seemed to happen without reason. These are just some examples of doubts that people have and that are not uncommon to hear expressed. Fortunately, however, knowledge about life before life holds the key to answering, the to answering these questions. And while it is certainly most fascinating to learn about our spiritual history, whether from a scientific or philosophical perspective, there's much more to it than just interest and intrigue. There is a great moral significance to it all. And we are tremendously fortunate to have in spiritism, not only the concepts of interest, but also the explanations about what they mean to us as individuals and as a collective community of human spirits, brothers and sisters, children of the same God. In the spiritist body of knowledge, we find answers to all these questions. As a result, our new understanding strengthens and energizes our faith. It gives us a renewed sense of hope and purpose. And we find the inspiration that we need to really make the best of this life with an understanding of our past and an eye on the future. Thank you so much for your attention.